Hare Krishna Maharaj. Please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. All Gurus to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharaj. All our Guru Maharajas. Maharaj, if you be so kind, if you could kindly enlighten us from um, Srimad Bhagavatam. Today we are reading from Canto 7, chapter number 1, verses 36 and 37. Maharaj, whenever you're ready, if you might. Take the I have a I have a personality here I would like to introduce to you before we start. Sure. Okay. Maybe you know him. Who Come is and, that? You can see. Oh, Hari 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 Hari. Please accept my humble obeisances, Prabhu. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and Guru Maharajas. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes, we very well know Prabhuji. He, he oh. comes here to Iskon Naperville all the time and we hear from him, yet we are not able to apply whatever he asks us to do. So that's the problem, Maharaj. <laughs> I do I that now you will remember to apply now. <laughs> I was just at his house for lunch, so I'm we're here in Vrindavan. <laughs> oh, wonderful! Oh, wonderful! Yeah, yeah. But he's so humble that he's gonna let me do the the, the whole program. So I. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so much, Amarendra Prabhuji, for your kind presence. Thank you. Please bless us. Yes, thank you for your darshan, Prabhu. <laughs> thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Maharaj. We would be studying from Srimad Bhagavatam today from Canto 7, chapter number 1, verses are 36 and 37. Whenever you're ready. Hare Krishna. Okay. Give us the screen and we'll go and ready to go. Okay, so let me see here. Okay. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. You could give me just one 30 second break and I'll be right back. Sure.
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Ram Hare, Ram 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 Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Ram 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 Shri Mataji to Maharaj know that his connection has lost. Yes, Mataji, he told that he'll be back. Yeah, but he went out of the camera, Mataji. No, first he just said he will be in 30 seconds, but then connection has gone, right? He yes. has gone. It has his uh, internet is not well functioning in uh, in Vrindavan. Is that why? But it will come. Okay, okay. Yeah, he's back. Yeah. It happens often. Yeah, yeah. He's back. He's back. Yeah. Hare Krishna, can you hear me? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Yes, we can hear you. Hare Krishna. I'm in Vrindavan, and you can expect that I might drop off every once in a while. This internet is a little unsteady here. Sure, Maharaj. But once I do, I'll be back. It'll take me like a minute or two to get back. Okay. We could bring up the verse again or start again. Sri Nara Uvacha Ekadam Ramana Putram Vishnu Lokam Yadrishyaya Sanandana Dalhu Jagmus Charanto Bhuvana Trayam Translations The great saint Narada said, Once upon a time when the four sons of Lord Brahma named Sanaka Sanandana, Sanatana, and Sanakumara were wandering throughout the three worlds. They came by chance to Vishnu Loka. Panchasadrayanarbha bhavya purishamati purvajaha bhigvasa sastini madhva vastatam bhatva Say that I'm Although these four great sages were older than Brahma's other sons, like Marichi, they appear like small naked children, only five or six years old. When Jai and Vijay saw them trying to enter by Punta Loka, these two gatekeepers. Thinking them ordinary children forbade them to enter. Therefore, in this regard, Sri Madhavacharya and his Tantrasara, Vasta Nityanam Vikarastavam Vitam, Adhikara Stitam Chaivam Vimutasya Vidajanaha, Vishnu Loka Stitam Purusham Varasapari Yonam. Adhakarastitam muktam vityatam panu vantitya vimukta nantaram tavisham varasam padayo nanu dehandriyasti yuktas cha purvam pascham natar yuta apti apyadi madri dishtam devam sat muktamar yuta. The third word is that the personal associates of Lord Vishnu and Vaikuntha Loka are always liberated souls. Even if sometimes cursed or blessed, they always are liberated, never contaminated by the modes of material nature. Before the liberation to Vaikuntha, 
they possess material bodies, and once they came to Vaikuntha, they no longer have them. Therefore, even if the associates of Lord Krishna sometimes descend as his curse, they are always liberated. Maharaj, your internet just told. Yeah, Maharaj said he will come back in two, two minutes, Mataji, if at all it happens. Mm. Maharaj is back. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, you are muted. Yeah, I asked him to unmute. Okay, yes, we're back. Okay, I'm sorry, it's just the internet is a little unstable here. Um, maybe if I shut off my video, I don't know if that will work. It might give us more. We can try it without. I'll keep the video on, but if it goes off again. So what we're hearing here in the very basis of a very powerful pastime, which is about to unfold, no matter is the appearance of the Lord in three different manifestations of himself, and six different demons which appeared during that time. Um, these six different demons were actually two personalities who apparently committed offense to the four Kumaras. The pastime goes that they were walking through the Vaikuntha realm on their way to see Lord Vishnu. Having passed through six gates without any difficulty, they came to the seventh gate. When they were about to go through that gate, they were stopped by the gatekeepers, Jai and Vijay. And uh, they felt insulted, thinking, why are we being checked? We want to see the Lord. And the gatekeepers couldn't recognize who they were. And so they immediately stopped their onward. These two, these devotees who are the four Kumaras, they're an incarnation of the trend of transcendental knowledge. They're sons of Lord Brahma. And they're very powerful. They have their own Sampradaya, or the Ch chapter Sh Shanu Sampradaya. Um, were angry. Sometimes it was to say, well, the devotees don't get angry. But sometimes when someone interferes or something interferes with their service to the Lord, they become angry or upset. So that anger is, is justifiable because it's all centered around service to the Lord. It's not anything about their personal interest. So then there was a discussion ensued at the gate and then this alerted Lord Vishnu and he came personally on Garuda to see. Seeing the situation and realizing that these gatekeepers had transgressed proper behavior, he apologized to the four Kumaras and explained that whatever my devotees do, please consider it my own fault. Of course, the four Kumaras were ready to accept the Lord's humility in that sense. And so the Lord finally said that actually, because they have offended you, 
uh, they have to leave this realm. And in that discussion between the gatekeepers and the four Kumaras, the four Kumaras said, you're not qualified to be in Vaikuntha just by your behavior. And so the Lord took the opportunity and he gave the, the gatekeepers, you will have to fall to the material world. And you can have a choice. You can take three births as demons, or you can take seven births as devotees. Wanting to get back as fast as they could, they took three births as demons and became the fighting element that Krishna fought with. The first one was Aranikashipu, that was Jai. The second one was Ravana, that was also Jai. And the third one was Sushupal, was also Jai. Vijay took three births as uh, Haranyaksha, Ubukarna, who were brothers, Haranikashipu and Ravana, and Dantravarka, who was a de another demon. And the first set of demons were killed by, well, the, 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 well by Haranyaksha, and ultimately, um, uh, Nishringadev. And the second set of demons were killed by Rava, by Ram, and the third by Krishna. So each of the incarnations of the Lord is Nishringadev, there's Ram. As Krishna, the Lord, fought with these demons and killed them. It's interesting to note that each of these demons, although they're demons, they had an outstanding quality, which characterized, was characterized of their activities. As it's mentioned in the Shastras, there are six enemies of the mind. Kama. Soda, Loba, Mohan, Madha, and Matsarya. Kama, lust, Soda, anger, Loba, greed, Mohan, illusion, Madha, pride, Matsarya, envy. Each one of these demons illustrated a particular one of these six, six enemies or bad qualities. Ranikashipu was the epitome of pride. He was so proud that he challenged even Indra, the king of heaven and the demigods. He was so arrogant in his pride that he thought no one could stop him. Of course, the Lord is all powerful. And we also know Rani Kasipu got the benediction that he would not be killed in so many ways. And the Lord, keeping the promise of Lord Brahma, kept all the benedictions and at the same time killed the demon. He was the demon of pride. Pride is something that is contrary to the soul's nature. The soul is by nature humble. Mm. The soul is by nature free from any personal desires for popularity or for distinction. And therefore this quality of pride is one of the most uh, diff uh, difficult qualities to get rid of, but at the same time, it blocks one's progress in devotional service. And when one becomes proud, and there's different ways that you can become proud. You can become proud because you are good looking. You can become proud because you are wealthy. You can become proud because you have achieved some fame in the world. You can become proud because you're strong. You can become proud because you 
you have knowledge, or you can become proud of because you're renounced. And people find ways to become proud. Sometimes we say even a pauper is proud of his own penny. But pride is contrary to the soul's nature. And all of these prides are due to material taints and material designation, which have nothing to do with the soul's existence. And so in order to destroy the demon of pride, the Lord appeared as the Shingadev and destroyed him. So in practicing Krishna consciousness, we may have many good qualities. We may also have many uh, accomplishments. We also may have many material benefits that came to us by way of our good karma. If we become proud of these things, these things make it difficult for us to make progress in devotional service. And uh, pride also causes one to think that they're better than others, which is the most dangerous because it is contrary to the soul's natural humility. The Lord never thinks they're better than anyone. They always think they're a servant of everyone. And therefore, even if they have outstanding qualities, still they give credit to the Lord for his mercy that has allowed them to have these qualities so they can serve the Lord with them. So therefore, one has to be very careful not to become proud. And pride is contrary. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya said, Kyanara pi sumi chena, ayori vasa hishuna, amanina mamana deina, kirtaniya sadhana him. One has to be give respects to all others and not expecting only respect for oneself. And then one can continuously chant the holy name. Uh, his brother, Ranyaksha, he was the personification of greed. He uh, wanted to take as much gold as he could from the earth, and he did. He exploited the earth for as much gold as he could, and because of that, the earth fell from its natural orbit in the cosmological system into the Garbhadak ocean. The Lord came as Hiranyaksha. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, the uh, uh, Varahade. He came as Varahade. And he lifted the ocean and he lifted the earth out of the ocean and killed the demon. Greed is a quality that destroys all other good qualities. When people become greedy, people become greedy for money, people become greedy for sex, people become greedy for material things, more and more and more. Uh, the living entity should learn to live with what they need and not what they think they need. And if one lives according to the principles of Ishava Shamidam Sarvang, that means to uh, accept whatever you need to keep body and soul together so you can execute devotion. So this greed is a quality of the mode of ignorance. And people who are greedy are never liked by others, and even though they may be also greedy. <laughs> And greed destroys all of one's good qualities. So one should learn to live simply and be satisfied whatever the Lord provides by one's natural efforts in this world. So one has to be careful not to fall into that uh, consciousness that more will make me happy. Our happiness is not based on how much we have and I'm based on who we are. So this greed gives a, puts us in the wrong consciousness and makes us think that happiness is to get more and more. 
The second set of demons were Ravana and Kubukarna. Now, Ravana was the personification of lust. He had so many wives, and even the most qualified wives. He, his most prominent wife was Mandodari. She is glorified as being one of the chaste ladies in the Vedic culture. And he had so many ladies, but he was never satisfied. And therefore, he stole the wife of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which cost him his life. So this lust, as it's explained in the, in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, is like a fire-eating dragon. The more you put fuel on a fire, the more the fire will burn. The more you try to satisfy your lusty desires, the more the, satis the, the fire of lust burns. But it's very... Uh, very, uh, what's the word, very hard to understand because when one has lusty desires, they try to fulfill them. And when they fulfill them, the satisfaction of lust is there and the fire goes down. But just give it a little time and the fire again will burn. The example is given that if you're building a fire and then you throw a log on it, the new log will cause the fire to go down. But in due course of time, when that log catches fire, the fire will blaze even more brighter. So every time we try to satisfy our lusty desires, it goes down for a little while but then it burns even stronger as it comes back. So lust is never satisfied. What is lust? Lust is, to, is that energy, which is love of God, directed towards the material energy. Lust for money, lust for, lust for power, lust for sexual activities. In this case, for Ravana, it was sexual activities. He had a lot of power. He had followers. But he wanted more and more pleasures of the opposite sex. And so he was never satisfied. And because of that, he was killed by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So uh, lust can only be tempered by regulating the senses, as Krishna says. If you follow a regulated life, and live according to what we need. And uh, uh, in married life, there, there are restrictions. Everyone should follow these restrictions. And therefore, regulation in life helps one to control this desire for lust. And of course, as we develop our relationship with Krishna, and that relationship turns into a loving, a loving affection for Krishna, then the fire of lust that burns for the material attraction will gradually diminish and ultimately vanish. So one has to practice Krishna consciousness and get attached to Krishna. The love of Krishna is the actual principle of real love. And when it's diverted towards things in this world, it becomes lust, which is never satisfying. His brother, Kubakarna, was the personification of illusion, another one of the bad qualities. He was cursed to sleep 364 days a year and wake up one day a year and he could eat as much as he could. So his whole business was eating and sleeping. He uh, slept for 64 days. 365 days a year and ate for one day and went back to sleep. So this idea that I am this material body and the more I satisfy my senses, the more I happier I am. So excess eating, excess sleeping are qualities of this idea of bodily concept of life. 
So therefore, one has to regulate these activities. <laughs> and then, of course, he was also killed by Ram. He was a powerful demon that who came out of his sleeping uh, realm in order to assist his brother Ravana in the fight. But he was also killed by the Supreme Personality of God. So the Lord destroys this illusion by his uh, arrow of knowledge that we are not this body. And to take care of the body is very easy. We just regulate the senses. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, not too much, not too little. The Lord says one who is temperate with eating, sleeping, working, and recreation. Can easily um, execute the, the yoga system. So, and Krishna also says, one who eats too much or eats too little, sleeps too much or sleeps too little, cannot practice bhakti properly. So, keeping the body regulated, just what's needed, according to your requirements. Okay, and the last set of demons was. Um, Kishupal, he was the personification of envy. Uh, he was actually Krishna's cousin. He was born, and when he was born, he was born with four arms. Um, he was a divine birth. And uh, his mother, who was re related to Krishna's family, um, took him to astrologer, and the astrologer said that when he sees the person who will be the cause of his death, two of his arms will fall off. So she noted that. And after some time, she had a, a ceremony to honor her son by inviting all the relatives and friends to come and see the new child. So she invited Mother Yasoda to come and Krishna also. Krishna responded that you don't want me to come because Krishna knew the, the future. And she said, no, no, you have to come and see. It's your cousin. She was insistent. So Krishna said, okay, I'll come, but you're not going to be happy. So when Krishna came, he was standing near the cradle where the baby was, and he looked in. As soon as the baby saw Krishna, two of his arms fell off. And then uh, his mother said, oh, my God, Krishna, you're going to be the cause of the killing of my child. Krishna said, I don't want to do that, but he hates me. <laughs> he hates me. In fact, when Shishupal was born, the first words out of the baby's mouth was, you know, Krishna, you rascal. <laughs> You know, everybody notes in the children, uh, I'm sorry, the parents always note what their child says. What is the first words? Mama, Dada, Daka, Didi, first words of the child. But his first words were Krishna, you rascal. So Krishna said to his mother, I don't want to kill him, but he hates me. Therefore, I'll give him a benediction that he can blast from me 100 times. But if he goes over 100 without stopping, then I have to respond. So when there was the Rajasuya sacrifice after the Battle of Kulushetra held by King Yudhisthira, and Tishapa was also there. He was one of the royalties. And Krishna was also there. And they had to elect the most important person to be honored in that assembly. And everyone unanimously elected Krishna, except a few. A few didn't go along with him. When Shushupal saw that Krishna was elected, he became angry and stood up and started to criticize Krishna in different ways. And he was just going on and on and on and on and on. And Krishna, and Krishna was counting how many times he was criticizing him. And then it went 96, 97, 98, 99, 100. 
And then when he went past the hundred, as Krishna promised, Krishna took out his Sudarshan chakra and cut off his head right in the middle of the assembly. And you can see that picture is also there. That was one of the paintings drawn by the devotees. And he killed him right on the spot. He was so envious of Krishna. And he didn't want Krishna to be honored. So this principle of envy, as Srila Prabhupada says, that we fall to the material world because we're envious of God. Envy is the original sin that causes us to leave the spiritual world and take up activities in the material world. And then we go through different births. Finally, we come to the stage of human life after millions and millions of births. So what is this envy? Envy is this thing, this principle that um, I don't like who you are. I don't like what you have. So I don't like who you are means uh, you may be more important than me. And therefore, I feel unhappy because of that. I'm envious of your success. You may be more richer than me, more famous or whatever. Or I don't like um, um, what, you, or what you have, you know, you, whatever you have or whatever you are. In other words, I want to be better than you. I am better than you. You should not get the praise. You should, I should get the honor like that. And people contrive in so many different ways to destroy another from that. There was one devotee, he wrote a book. It was Gorgopal Prabhu. I'm sure you all heard of Gorgopal. One of our speakers. He wrote one nice book, and in there he describes one story where one man was working in one corporation, and he had created so many new ideas on how to increase the business of the corporation. And he was getting raises, promotions because of that, getting a lot of friends. But his fellow co-workers started to feel envious of him. So one day when he was out of his office, they snuck into his office and stole his computer and all of his material that he had gathered. So here's an example of how envy works. And someone else is successful, we become unhappy or angry with that. What is the antidote for envy? Is love or service. If you feel envious towards someone, serve that person. If you feel envious towards someone, glorify that person. Speak of their good qualities, and that will neutralize this envy. This envy, out of all of the bad qualities, is the worst because it contains lust, anger, greed, pride, and illusion within it. And as Srila Prabhupada mentions, that if you're non envious, you're in the spiritual world. If you're envious, you're in the material world. He made a complete distinction or division between using that quality that one has to be practiced this element. So how do you become non-envious? One of the ways is to be satisfied from whatever Krishna gives you. Yes, Krishna may give me so many things or he may not. That's okay. I'm happy whatever he gives. I'm grateful for whatever he's giving. I'm satisfied. So learning to be satisfied from what you are, who you are, and what you have, and that's all material anyway. So as long as we have a position to serve the Lord, we're happy. So whatever material things come and go, it doesn't really make, it make a difference because we can always serve the Lord in any situation. And therefore, a devotee is satisfied. And another element that, what, that can be thought about in relationship to this quality is that if you feel envious towards someone, that means you have your problem is not so much with that person, but with Krishna. 
because Krishna has allowed that person to have or be whatever they are, and therefore you don't like what Krishna has given that person. Therefore, your problem is with Krishna. If you look at it that way, then it becomes easy to understand that this envy is really a very bad quality and should be given up immediately simply by praising the person or by, or by doing some service for that person. And uh, envy is destroyed by devotional service. And the last demon was Dantravarta. He was the personification of anger. What is anger? Anger, as it's described in the scriptures, is the younger brother of desire. When desire is unfulfilled, one becomes angry. So Krishna was, Krishna was on his way to Vrindavan. He wanted to go and visit the residents of Vrindavan. And Dantuvarka came in front of Krishna and challenged him to a fight. And he was so angry at Krishna because Krishna had killed his good friend Shishupa that he wanted to avenge the life and the death of Shishupa. So it said, with his club, he attacked Krishna. And he hit Krishna in the chest with the club, but the club had no effect. And Krishna just grabbed the club, threw it away, and punched him right in the chest, and he died immediately. Krishna didn't waste time with this demon, because the reason why is that Krishna was in a hurry to get to Vrindavan, and uh, this demon was slowing him down. <laughs> And so he killed the demon of envy, I mean, of, of anger. So these three, two gatekeepers took three births each as six demons who exhibited these six bad qualities. And Krishna is a destroyer of all of these. If one takes the bhakti and practices care, carefully and Whenever you see a certain bad quality in you, you don't feed it, you don't uh, think about it, you simply uh, reject it and focus on devotion and service. Because in Kali Yuga, because the atmosphere is so polluted, lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, and envy are everywhere. They're in the atmosphere. So even if we're not practicing these things, we may be a, affected by it, by the association we keep or by the atmosphere that we're in. So one has to chat the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra to stay pure and free from the effects of these bad qualities and serve the Vaishnavas. Not only do we have to we should make it a program, a regular program to to in different ways. All right, this is a little bit about these demons, these six characteristics, and uh, ultimately, after being killed by Krishna in three verse, they were qualified to go back to Godhead. And they did, but then again, when they heard that Lord Chaitanya came, they wanted to again appear in the Lord's pastimes for another time. And both of these appeared as Jai and Vi, I mean, I'm sorry, Jagai and Madai in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, which were purified by Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya and made them into devotees. That was the fourth birth. That was an extra one that the that these two gatekeepers decided to take in order to be part of Lord Chaitanya's pastime. And we all know the story of Jagai and Mara. Very wonderful story. Okay, so I'll stop there and see what we have in the way of discussion. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Thank you for the wonderful stories. Thank you for sharing all the details. Of 
We really enjoyed listening to it. Maharaj, one quick question. How much, as you were talking, that we need to lead a balanced life, how much or how little is enough sleep or not enough sleep? Because the body is constantly tired. So how do we know um, we are not sleeping a lot or we are not sleeping too little? Well, the, the whole subject of sleep is an interesting category. And, um, but I was listening to Srila Prabhupada today, in fact, and he said one should not sleep no more than six hours, but utmost eight hours. He said after that, and then it's just complete ignorance. So he gave us a formula that one should sleep. No, he told us six hours when we first joined, but he's been a little bit you know, merciful in saying, well, some people require a little extra sleep, especially those who work with their mind. Their mind gets tired, so they might need a little bit more sleep. So he said up to eight hours is the most. Uh, but sleeping is directly affected by eating. If you eat too much, you'll sleep more. If you eat too less, you may also sleep more <clears throat> because you're too weak and you feel tired. Or if you eat more, then uh, uh, the body has to work harder and becomes more tired, breaking down the food. <clears throat> and that causes one to become tired. So therefore, if you want to regulate your sleeping, first regulate your eating. It's directly connected. Mm -hmm. So try to eat what's good for you and at regulated times. Not too much, not too little. Uh, I would also add, do not eat big meals at night. It's the worst time. It's bad for your health. It causes diabetes. People get diabetes because they eat big, big lunches at night or big dinners at night. Because then they can't digest and everything turns into glucose. And that's what causes one to become diabetic. So um, your main meal should be lunch. Breakfast should be nice, moderate, not too heavy, light. Main meal is lunchtime when the sun is at the highest time. And in the evening, something light before taking rest. If you decide to eat it before taking rest, give yourself three hours after from the time you take before you take rest. Okay. Digestion slows down as the sun goes down. So when the sun is in the highest part, the digestion is at the highest. So. Um, like that. Thank you so much, Maharaj. We have a quick question on the chat box uh, from um, Scarlett Mataji. She's saying, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada and your holiness. May I humbly ask, do the soul feel pain, sorrow, sadness, happiness, or is this feeling our illusion and imagination? Because the soul identifies with the mind, the mind experiences only. Therefore, the soul thinks that it's going through this, but material nature cannot touch the soul. Example. Example is you go to sleep at night. You're laying in your bed and you're dreaming. You're dreaming you're climbing a mountain, chased by a tiger, having a nice relationship with some beautiful man or woman. But none of that's happening. It's all in the dream state. You're simply there laying on your bed. So this world is like that. It's a dream. We're dreaming. We're happy. We're dreaming. We're sad. We're dreaming that we're a man and a woman. All of the material activities that we go through in this world 
is part of our waking dream state. It's a, it's a state of dreaming, but we call it waking dream. <laughs> We're none of these things, and the soul is never touched by any of it. So using the example of a dream, that's the same thing that's happening on the waking stage. But because we identify with the mind and body, we're experiencing these things. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your kind answer. Maharaj, you were uh, mentioning that, um, of course, the, we at the jivas, we fall down because, of course, for our envy that we had, as a result of which we are thrown out of the spiritual world. I understand our first birth is as Brahma in any of the universes. So my question is, Maharaj, after the birth of Brahma, do we continue to constantly fall down until we become like a jellyfish or something and then rise back again? Is that no, how it no. is or it depends? No, it says you take your first birth as Brahma and then you fall all the way down from that to the lowest. And you, the, the lowest forms are the aquatics, the aquatics. In the aquatics, then comes the creepers, the trees, the insects. And then from there comes the, um, the birds, and then the beasts, and then the humans. So yeah, so one falls. Sometimes it says you fall directly down to the lowest stage, and other times it says you fall from Brahma, then go to the lowest stage. But it doesn't really matter. You're falling. That's all that counts. <laughs> Maharaj, one quick question. As, as Lord has given us a free will or something, so when we hear that we fall down from the stage of Brahma to the very lowest, is that kind of like predestined or it varies from person to person or that's like unavoidable? That you have to go to the lowest and come back? It's, our births are not, not within our hands. That's given to us by material nature. And falling from the spiritual world means you, know, you fall in a certain way and then you go, then you traverse up the evolutionary scale until you again reach the human form of life. Once you get to human life, then you can go either up or down. Before those species in the lower, they can only go up. Thank you That's so much. That, yeah. If you read the third canto in Bhagavatam, it'll explain all of that. Sure. Maharaj, we have a question from Shiv Kumar Prabhuji on the chat box. He's saying, does sattvic lifestyle help with anartha nibriti to deal with the, these six bad qualities? I have some yeah. experience with someone who is sattvic, at least outwardly, not no. able to take up bhakti at all. At the same time, some devotee who seemed to be very conditioned, I may be wrong, um, maybe wrong, but very strong in sadhana bhakti in spite of severe reverses in life. How can we understand the effect of sattvic mode in taking up bhakti or practicing bhakti? Well, sattvic qualities are, are encouraged to rise above the lower modes of nature and come to the mode of goodness. And, when, and de developing the mode of goodness means developing the good qualities of the human being. Uh, humility, tolerance, pridelessness, uh, uh, Equal, equally poised in happiness and distress, simplicity, cleanliness, truthfulness, study of the scriptures, knowledge of the scriptures. Um, these are mentioned as the qualities of the mode of goodness. Krishna mentions them in the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So scripture encourages that Krishna also told Arjuna, come to the mode of goodness. And from mode of goodness, you can go to transcendence. But in some cases, 
people who are down and out and trodden, if they take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master, can execute devotional service. Kiratu hunam palinda pukasa, ambira sambara gyalyas, ambira sambara pukasa, prasadaya, yenijane rupas rayasraya, sudanti prabhavishnave namaha. That these are mentioned that people who are born in a very low material situation, they're just almost man animals, some of them, if they come in contact with a bona fide spiritual master and take to the process of devotional service, they can rise up. So uh, some people become enamored by their mode of goodness and think that the mode of goodness is the success in life. For others who are lower realize that in their situation, they're not happy, but still they take the devotional service. They can recognize that this devotional service is will elevate them to a better position, give them the happiness and the knowledge they're looking for. Somehow or other, they became fortunate by receiving this knowledge. So how did that manifest? We don't know. Many, it's usually manifested because people in their previous lives have done something to gain access to devotional service in the present life. Whereas a person who has many good qualities may mistakenly think that this is the success of life. And therefore, there's no need to go in. I'm a good person. I give in charity. I, uh, I go to church. I go to the temple. I, uh, I, I never hurt anyone. I never lie. I never cheat. I'm kind to everyone. So they uh, mistakenly think they have achieved the, the goal of life, which is not true. The goal of life is to engage in devotional service. And the, go, the qualities of the mode of goodness are con conducive to executing devotions. But even if people who are lower than goodness take the devotional service, they can develop good qualities in due course of time. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your wonderful answer. Maharaj, one follow-up question. So uh, the goal of life is, of course, devotional service or going back to Godhead. Yes. But is that, um, can we also have material goals or no? Or that's that's considered like conflict of interest? Can we yes. balance? You can fulfill all of your desires in devotional service. You cannot fulfill your desires in material life. Although you think you can. Uh, just Krishnaize your life. Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yat Karosi Adanasi Yat Jahosi Vadasi Yat Yat Tapasi Tukuntayat Tat Kurusho Marathanam. All that you do, all that you eat, all that you offer, and all that you give away should be done as an offering to me. Krishna recommends. Krishnaize your life, whatever you do, connect it to devotional activity. Whether it's maintaining your family, working at a particular occupation, try to do everything in, this, in the mood of devotion to Krishna. Uh, no, and to chase after material desires means to try to mix uh, material and spiritual together. That is called mixed devotee. A mixed devotee can never be happy because they can't they can't uh, become successful in material life, nor can they become successful in spiritual life. They're in the middle there. Thank so sometimes, you. sometimes people give up spiritual life so they can go full force into material life. 
But one who's intelligent will realize that anything material is temporary and full of problems. If I want to be happy, my happiness is based on my relationship with Krishna. That's the happiness of the devotees experience, which is the nature of the soul's existence. We are naturally in love with Krishna. That's not contrary to our nature. We have been thr thrown in this material world, and now we look towards material things to fulfill that desire for happiness, which it can never do. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Darshini Mataji, would you like to go ahead, please? Thank you so much, Mataji. Hare Krishna Maharaj, Tandavat Pranam, Paul Kaurish, Shashila Prabhupada. Please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, I just had one question. Um, on February 11, 1975, Srila Prabhupada says that, uh, you know, when we are children, we are innocent and we have no bad habits. But as we grow and associate with bad company, we also acquire these bad habits. But we also, um, you know, see that, you know, the bad habits are uh, you know, the habit that are coming from the mind, right? From the subtle body. So that has been there from a lot of uh, past life. So how do we understand this? Like, why is it not present during childhood when we are children? Yeah, and it hasn't developed yet. Just like Prabhupada says, the, 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 the propensity for sex life is there, but the body is not developed. So it cannot happen. But once the body develops, then that, that desire starts to manifest. So these desires are already there within. And by the association, they come out or they come become purified. That's why if you raise the children in a Krishna conscious way, these qualities will develop into spiritual qualities. But if they have negative or material association, then these qualities will manifest because it's there from the time that they're born. And so it's you see, you have to expose them to the right association. Yeah. Thank you so much, Maharaj. And Maharaj, I had one more uh, question, like from the previous question. How do we, you know, come out of that mixed nature of a devotee, from a mixed devotee to a proper devotee? How can we move from there? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Chant the holy names. <laughs> Purify the consciousness through the chanting of the holy name. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maharaj. Pandavat Pranams. Hare Krishna Maharaj. But not just not just uh, mechanical chanting, but real chanting. Chant from the heart. Mm. Chant with enthusiasm. Chant to please Krishna. Chant with attention. Chant understanding that is the most important part of our spiritual practice. When you chant in the right consciousness, the consciousness will propel you to receive the mercy of the Lord. <laughs> Everything is there in the holy name. Because it's Krishna himself in sound. Wonderful. Thank Very you so much, Maharaj. Wonderful, wonderful answer. Thank you, Maharaj. And thank you, Mataji, for that question. Makes a lot of sense. Shiva Kumar Prabhuji, would you like to go ahead, please? Hare Krishna. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Dandavat Prams, Maharaj. Maharaj, one uh, follow-up question, Maharaj. Uh, in a couple of classes, I heard uh, the peaceful life is a product of uh, Sattvic mode or is an expectation from Sattvic mode. So kind of I am getting a uh, um, uh, notion from those classes that the expectation that the life has to be peacefully sexually coming from the Sattvic mode, which is material. So I just wanted to understand from you, Maharaj, is that wrong in... I expecting that the life has to be peaceful in Krishna consciousness is that uh, totally material? If you if you're not peaceful, it's hard to do anything. <laughs> so how do you become peaceful? Well, practice chanting, and the mind will start to settle down. 
Yeah. Peace is the first principle by which you can you live life, either materially or spiritually. Of course, you can come to spiritual life and not be peaceful and then practice Krishna consciousness. And by, by practicing it right, you become peaceful. Peaceful means not being agitated by happiness and distress, by being satisfied in one's <laughs> devotional life. Okay. Peaceful means, uh, yeah, being happy for whatever food you get, being happy whatever money comes automatically by material arrangements. Okay. And if you want to be peaceful, give in charity also. Mm -hmm. It's important. Well, and charity in Krishna consciousness means to support Krishna conscious projects. Mm -hmm. People who don't use their money for the benefit of others become unhappy and greedy and they become self-centered. One has to give in charity regularly. Okay. Even if you don't, it doesn't matter how much you have or don't have, you should give something in charity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful answer again. Um, Sri Devi Mataji, would you like to go ahead, please? Thank you, Nina. Dear Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Guru Maharaj, you were speaking about mixed devotee, and Darshini Mataji was asking about mixed devotion, which is where we are. But sometimes it seems as though materially also we are not achieving anything. Spiritually, also, we are not achieving anything. So, how can we feel motivated to go on when we are not, uh, when we seem uh, stuck, not making any progress? Apparently, at least. Well, let's see if you're committing any offenses. Get the holy name, but avoid the 10 offenses. If you're chanting with offenses, then it becomes difficult to make progress. And so try to chant free from the offenses, work on attentive chanting, and uh, practice, you know, the renunciation helps us to become peaceful more when we start giving up our ideas on how much we need to live in this world. We need very little to live, but we're conditioned to think we need so much. And if you really want to be happy, as Prabhupada says, use every moment to serve the Lord. He said, this is the key to success in, and spiritual life. Not one moment wasted. So just like you're doing a service, and you're thinking when this service is over, what will I be doing? You have something immediately for the next service and the next service. And, the, and so your whole day is full. And if there's some gap, Chan Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Very nice. Keep the mind busy, or else the mind will keep you busy. <laughs> don't be, you control the mind, and don't be controlled by it. Use the mind for what towards Krishna, or rather, the mind will use you for whatever it wants to do. Thank you. Beautiful questions, beautiful answers. Devotees, go ahead, switch on your videos so Maharaj can 
can look at you and bless you with his eyes. <laughs> Nina, you're very humorous. <laughs> no, Maharaj, I mean it. <laughs> and I believe all the devotees know that. Like, you know, how wonderful and how you can bless all of us. Shiva Kumar Prabhuji, you have another question? Um, uh, Mataji, not a question, Mataji. I just got reminded of the story that Maharaj shared in one of the lectures about seeing, uh, you know, each other. It's, it's a, it's a, it's, we are fortunate to get darshan of Maharaj, but uh, I, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not being, trying to be humble. I am sometimes sometimes afraid that uh, is it okay for Maharaj to see my face? You know, I just get reminded of the story that Maharaj shared in one of the lectures about Birbal and Akbar uh, seeing each other a person in the early morning and what happens after that, you know, in terms of asp material auspiciousness. Uh, I just thought I will share it. Thank That's you, nice. thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that remark. Yes. I've been told that. Maharajas, when they would glance at us, look at us automatically because they're so elevated, the heart is so pure that somehow we get those energies, those vibes, and maybe it will trigger a little bit of purity within us too. A little bit of contamination will get destroyed. True. Any questions for His Holiness? Sindhu, Mataji, please go ahead. Thank you, Mataji. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prabhu, for such a wonderful uh, class, Maharaj. I just had one question about Jay and Vijay. Did they know that Krishna wanted, um, did they know that Krishna wanted to fight with them, show the chivalry rasa, and that's why they opted for three um, lifetimes of being demons? Just to serve the Lord? The, the Lord wanted them to choose that because he wanted them to fight. And so he inspired them to, to decide in that way. But they did yeah. not. They did not. Yeah. It says, that, it says the fighting propensity is very much prominent in Krishna, but he cannot fight in the spiritual world, so he has to fight when he comes to the material world. So he wanted to prop us that he wanted to work out, flex his muscles and get a little exercise. And so the, when the demons get killed, they get liberated. So it's good for them also. So yeah, whether they knew it or not, it's really hard to say, but it, it appears there was no indication in that story that they did. Thank you, Maharaj. One follow-up question about these um, material desires, material desires, renunciation, and everything. There is a thin line between renunciation and taking care of our responsibilities, right? Sometimes when you think of renunciation, I think it crosses the line where we try to give up our responsibilities also and take it very lightly. Is that true? Well, that's not renunciation. If you have responsibilities, then you should carry them out. Renunciation is different. You can't renounce something that is a requirement. We can learn how to, of course, as we make progress in devotional service, our material responsibilities become less. Then they become easily easily manageable. But uh, if we think that I'm renouncing because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to do, it's not renouncing anything. Thank you, Maharaj. Uh, one follow-up question. Sorry for so many questions. Um, the reversals in life, right? The reversals in life. Sometimes what happens is no matter how much we are in Krishna consciousness and we are trying to do the service, being engaged, the mind... I don't know if the mind plays the trick or something which has been happening, the reversal, it just comes and stands in front of you, right? 
I mean, it does. It just takes away your mind, and you get into that spiral. Um, yeah, we're conditioned, and we're trying to become unconditioned. We're going through a transformation. We're trying to awaken our spiritual nature and get rid of our material coverings. So this is a process. So do not become discouraged by these things. Just push on in your devotional service. That's all. And eventually they become less and it'll go away. Devotional service, you can't expect to get a diploma as soon as you enter into the school. You have to go through all of the grades. So devotional service is a process. And the process is not like it's going to take you, you can't put a timeline on it. It may happen quickly, it may happen slowly. It depends on how conditioned you are and how much you are. So if you follow the process that's given by Rupa Goswami, uh, when you make those instructions, and then if you follow that process, then you execute devotional service uh, in a way that is not, it doesn't interfere, things don't interfere with our progress. And he explained that in Nectar of Devotion, verse number two and verse number three. Verse number two, six things to avoid. Verse number three, six things to uh, apply. So, uh, if negative thoughts come up, just dismiss them. It's part of our association with Maya, our condition. Just keep focusing on the positive. That's all. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you so much. The negative will go away. In due course. Thank you so much for your mercy. Just talking to all of us, right? That is your mercy. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mataji, for your wonderful reflection and wonderful questions. Devotees, don't hesitate. Any last minute questions for His Holiness? That's it, Maharaj. Everybody has become sublime. Oh, we see Sri Devi Mataji. Would you like to go ahead, Mata? Yes, please, if you don't mind. Uh, so, Guru Maharaj, some, uh, some of us may be having depression going back to even previous lifetimes. And in this lifetime, we suffer from chronic depression or chronic anxiety, things like that, which are very deep-rooted anarthas. So in such cases, along with chanting the holy names, engaging in the process of bhakti, is it recommended to also take medications? I can't say yes or no. It depends on the situation. Medication is required and take it. If it's, if it's not required, don't take it. And then you have to understand whether it is or not. Medication is not something you may choose, but before you take any medication, you should understand. And when you speak about medication, what are you talking about? Doctor's prescriptions or your own ideas? No, no, a regular Ayurvedic, homeopathic, or if people choose allopathic medication, though I personally, uh, my personal preference is to recommend allopathic, um, Ayurveda and homeopathy. No, you have to take care of the body. Okay, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Okay, we can stop here. I do have another engagement coming up very soon. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Maharaj. Many pranams at your lotus feet. Ban, ban, chakal, patarubhya, shikripa, sinthubhya, eva, chapatita, nam, pavane, pyo, vaishnavi, pyo, namo, namaha. Srimad, Gandharaj, His Holiness Chandramoli Swami Maharaj, ki, go, Ranga.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Mara. Thank you so much.